All right, guys, a couple things before we got started. Yesterday we finished up here where he's going to make traps to catch his wild game. For whatever reason, my video stopped kind of short. I kept reading for another three pages and realized that that was it. Well, I didn't start it over. I just thought I'd read a little more today. So he's going to make traps to catch wild game, but he wanted to catch these fish first. Here we go. I looked into the stream to see what else I could eat. And as I did, my hand knocked a rotten log apart. I remembered about the old logs and all the sleeping stages of insects that are in there. I chopped away until I found a cold, white grub. I swiftly tied a string to my hook and put the grub on it. I walked up the stream looking for a good place to fish. All the manuals I had read were very emphatic about where fish lived, and so I had memorized this. Here's where they live. In streams, fish usually congregate in pools and deep, calm water. The heads of riffles, small rapids, the tails of pools, eddies below rocks or logs, deep undercut banks, in the shade of overhanging bushes, all are very likely places to fish. This stream did not seem to have any calm water, and I must have walked a thousand miles before I found the pool by a deep undercut bank with the shade of an overhanging hanging bush. Now, a thousand miles, he's exaggerating. Actually, it wasn't that far. I had just seen that way because I went looking and finding nothing. I was sure I was going to starve to death. I squatted on the bank and dropped in my line. I did so want to catch a fish. One fish would set me upon my way because I had read how much you can learn from one fish. By examining the contents of its stomach, you can find what the other fish are eating, or you can use the internal organs as bait. The grub went down to the bottom of the stream. It swirled around and hung still. Suddenly, the string came to life and rode back and forth and around in a circle. I pulled with a powerful jerk. The hook came apart, and <laughs> whatever I had went circling back to its bed. So his little hook that he broke that he made broke. Well, that almost made me cry. My bait was gone, my hook was broke, and I was getting cold, frightened, and mad. I whittled another hook, but this time I cheated and used string to wind it together instead of bark. I walked back to the log and luckily found another grub. I hurried to the pool, I flipped in the tr I, and I flipped a trout out of the water before I even knew I had a bite. The fish flopped, and I threw my whole body over it. I could not bear to think of it flopping back, flopping itself back into the stream. I cleaned it like I had seen the man at the fish market do, examined its stomach, and found it empty. This horrified me. What I didn't know was that an empty stomach means the fish are hungry and will eat about anything. However, I thought at the time that I was a goner. Sadly, I put some of the internal organs on my hook. And before I could get my line to the bottom, I had another bite. I lost that one, but got the next one. I stopped when I had five nice little trout. Now, trout are delicious to eat, especially brook trout or stream trout like these are. And looked around for a place to build a camp and make a fire. It wasn't hard to find a pretty spot along the stream. I said, selected a place beside a mossy rock in a circle of hemlocks. Those are a type of trees. I decided to make a bed before I cooked. I cut off some some bows for a mattress. Then I le leaned some dead limbs against the boulder and carved them with the hemlock limbs. This made a kind of tent. I crawled in, lay down, and felt alone and seek and secret and very excited. But ah, the rest of the story. I was on the northeast side of the mountain. It grew dark and cold early. Seeing the shadows slide down on me, I frankly ran around gathering firewood. This is about the only thing. Here's some nice pictures. There's this big rock where he stacked this stuff up against, and here's where he's going to try to build a little fire. A couple of good shelters made sure your fire on the scraped earth also sure to put it out. I did right from the moment until dawn. Be because I remember that driest wood in the forest is the dead limbs that are still on the trees. I gathered an enormous pile of them. That pile must still be there. 
for I never got a fire going. So he gathered all this wood, but he never got it to burn. I got sparks, sparks, sparks. I even hit the tinder with the sparks. The tinder burned all right, but that was as far as I got. I blew on it, I breathed on it, I cupped it with my hands, but no sooner had I added twig than the whole thing went black. Then it got too dark to see. I clicked steel and flint together even though I couldn't see the tinder. Finally I gave up and crawled into my hemlock tent. Hungry, cold, and miserable. Now you got five fish, but fish, you can't really eat raw fish. I know there's certain cultures that like to eat special raw fish, but not very much. I can talk about the first night now, although it still is embarrassing to me because I was so stupid and scared, and I hate to admit it. I had made my hemlock bed right in the stream valley where the wind dried, drained down to the cold mountaintop. It might have been all right if I had made it on the other side of the boulder, but I didn't, and I was right on the main highway of the cold winds as they tore down upon the valley below. And I didn't have enough hemlock burrs under me, and before I had my head down, my stomach was cold and damp, meaning wet. I took some of the burrs off the roof and stuffed them under me, and then my shoulders were cold. I curled up in a ball and I almost and was almost asleep when a whippoorwill called. Now, whippoorwill actually sounds like its name. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. That's the sound that the bird makes. If you have ever been within 40 feet of a whippoorwill, you will understand why I couldn't even shut my eyes. They are deafening. Well, anyways, the whole night went like that. I didn't think I slept 15 minutes, and I was so scared and tired that my throat was dry. I wanted a drink, but didn't dare go near the stream for fear of making a misstep and falling and getting wet. So I sat tight and shivered and shook, and now I was able to say I cried for a little bit, teeny bit. Fortunately, the sun has a wonderful, glorious habit of rising every morning. When the sky lightened and the birds woke, I knew I would never again see anything so splendid as the round red sun coming up over the earth. I was immediately cheered and set out directly for the highway. Somehow I thought that if I ran, if I was a little near the road, everything would be all right. I climbed a hill and stopped. There was a house, a house warm and cozy with smoke coming out of the chimney and lights at the windows and only a hundred feet from my torture camp. Now he says that because he was stinking his sleep last night. Without considering my pride, I ran down the hill, and I banged on the door. A nice old man answered. I told him everything at one, in one long sentence, and then said, And so, I can, cook, can I cook my fish here? Because I haven't eaten in years. He chuckled, stroked his wrinkly face, and took the fish. He had them cooking in a pan before I knew what his name was. That's pretty nice. Remember, people out in the country like this in the wilderness sometimes are very, very nice. When I asked him, he said Bill something, but I never heard his last name because I fell asleep in his rocking chair that was pulling up and down beside a big, hot, glorious wood stove in the kitchen. I ate the fish some hours later, also some bread, jelly, oatmeal, and cream. Then he said to me, Sam, Gribbly, if you are going to run off and live in the woods, you better learn how to make a fire. Come with me. We spent the afternoon practicing. I penciled these notes on the back of a scrap of paper so I wouldn't forget. Boy, this man sure seems nice to help him get started like this. When the tinder glows, keep blowing and add fine dry needles one by one to keep and keep blowing steadily, lightly, evenly. Add one inch dried twigs to the needles and then give her a good handful of small dry stuff. Keep blowing. Now when you blow on a fire, <sighs> fires actually are like human beings. They need oxygen to live. And so when you blow, blow on them, <sighs> you're blowing the wind or the oxygen onto the fire. That will help it burn. Well, we're on to the next chapter tomorrow.